to our fifth. Welcome to our fifth in the winter speaker series. We are very happy, of course, to be partnered with Friends of the Napanee River. And thanks very much to uh, Lawrence O'Keefe and Art Dunham for all their help with the series from that group. Uh, we know there are probably folks on tonight uh, too from Friends of Wilton Creek Watershed. Well, I know there are, I see Adele right there <laughs> uh, and probably others. And also supporters of the Hastings Stewardship Council. So it's nice to welcome those people as well. Uh, as always, this presentation will, of course, be recorded. And I know Stephanie just pushed the button. Um, and then the link will be sent out to all of you in the next couple of days. So if you want to share it with friends or watch it again, you can do that. Uh, recordings of all of our speakers are always available on the um, on YouTube. And all you have to do is go to uh, YouTube, search for Friends of the Napanee River, and you can find all our recordings. However, they are also both on our websites. Uh, it's not changing slides. Why not? Oh, maybe it's this one. No, I can do that. Well, try clicking. Mm. Uh, in any case, we're just uh, getting the slides going here for some reason. They're not wanting to change. Yeah. Mm. Um, in any case, we are uh, there. We go. Thank you. Ah, um, so this is the uh, listing, of course, of the uh, winter winter speaker events we've had so far, one to four. Um, and the uh, last two are listed there as well, our May um, speaker and our June speaker. And actually at the end of our um, presentation tonight, somebody's going to uh, give us a quick little preview of our next event in May. So you'll get that. Yep. So if you happen to want to become a member of the Friends of the Salmon River, there's our membership information for you. Um, and there's our uh, website if, uh, if you need it for, um, for that purpose. Uh, or you can contact our treasurer, Dave, by email um, in terms of uh, getting a membership. And of course, if you are wanting a membership with Friends of the Napanee River, there is where you go. Um, and as well, if anybody cares to make a donation to either group, you can um, also do that by using the by contacting the same um, websites or emails. I'm just going to call on Stephanie to mention a few things about the photo contest. Uh, yeah, so Friends of the Salmon River is running a photo contest. We've actually closed submissions and we've had all of the photos entered that are being judged, but you have your chance to vote in the competition if you'd like. Um, you can go to our website and there's a voting link there. And we also might send out the link after this presentation um, and you can choose which photo you like the best. And then the winners will go on to be judged by a number of um, artists and specialists. And then there'll be a few terrific prizes from local artists for the top four pictures that were selected. So yeah, thanks. Okay. So we're going to get on now to um, our speaker for tonight, who of course is Amanda Tracy. Um, just to remind everybody about how questions work. If you have any questions during Amanda's session, uh, please use the chat function, which is of course at the bottom of your screen. And you can type your question or comment into there. Make sure it, it says to everyone so that we'll all see it. Um, and at the end of Amanda's session, we will um, direct the questions to her and make sure we get all your questions answered. OK, um, to introduce Amanda Tracy. Amanda Tracy studied biology at Queen's University. She completed there a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD. She worked as a research and teaching associate at Queen's. Currently, Amanda's working as a conservation biologist. Specifically, she is the coordinator of conservation biology for Central Ontario East Region for the Nature Conservancy of Canada, based out of Napanee. 
Here, she's responsible for planning and executing the stewardship of the properties owned by NCC in the Napanee Plains and the Eastern Lake Ontario coast natural areas. Amanda's expertise is in terrestrial ecology and she also uh, is a certified Ontario wetland evaluator. Amanda has been actively involved with the Kingston Field Naturalists, mainly as a leader for the junior naturalist group. And a few years ago, she was coordinator of Let's Talk Science, a classroom K-12 program uh, out of Queens. Amanda Tracy is also a director with Friends of the Salmon River. And in fact, this season, she took on the role of becoming our water ranger, which means that she'll be doing water testing and um, data reporting for the Salmon River watershed. So we're really glad about that. She's also a valued partner of the Lennox and Addington Stewardship Council. And this next part's kind of funny in her spare time, like Amanda doesn't have any spare time. However, if she did have, she also enjoys fishing, hiking and gardening. So Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Susan, for that lovely introduction. I uh, was quite excited about gardening until I saw the weather for tomorrow. So I think, like most people, I'll have to hold off now until the long weekend in May when we're, we're safe. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, so um, thank you everybody for attending tonight. Invasive species is always one of my favorite things to talk about, but it's unfortunate that um, we have to talk about it, but we do. Um, and so tonight I am going to uh, walk you through a whole bunch of different things related to invasive species. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit briefly about uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada and our work in the area. And then I'm going to go through a whole bunch of different invasive species. Um, like Susan said, my expertise really is in, in terrestrial uh, plant species, but I am going to include some information about some other very common invasive species, zebra mussels and, and gypsy moth, to name a couple. And then uh, once we go through all the different invasive species, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how landowners can make decisions about how to actually control invasive species on their properties, uh, including a little bit of an example that we can work through together, and then go into invasive species reporting, uh, so how you can let people know when you find invasive species, and also uh, what you can do to get involved with invasive species. <clears throat> so just to start, um, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, or NCC, uh, our, our mission is to lead and inspire everyone to join us in creating a legacy for future generations by conserving the important natural areas and biological diversity across the entire country. And uh, NCC was started in 1962, and since then um, has protected with uh, alone and with partners over 14 million hectares of land in Canada, and that includes 200 and, uh, habitat for 231 uh, species at risk. And in Ontario specifically, uh, NCC's helped protect more than 83,000 hectares, uh, everywhere from the north shore of Lake Superior to Pelee Island, um, down to the south shore of Prince Edward County, and then of course the Alvars, the beautiful Alvars of the Napanee Plain. And just to give you a bit of perspective and talk a little bit about NCC and our work in, in the area specific to both the Salmon River and the Napanee River, so NCC, obviously, when you think about conservation at the scale of all of Canada, that's quite overwhelming because Canada is so big. So how we focus our work is by dividing the areas we work in into natural areas. So these are areas that are of interest um, biologically for some various reasons. So one of our natural areas, one that I'm responsible for, is called the Napanee Plain. And you can see the boundary of the Napanee Plain here in green. It's a, the area of the Napanee Plain natural area is about 440,000 uh, acres, so quite big. And even then, working at that scale, it's still that's still 400 plus thousand acres. That's really hard to focus your work. So what we've done is divided into um, little 
focal areas. So if you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my curve, but this green blob up here in the northwest corner, uh, that is what we call the uh, Manzel Stoko corridor. So this is the land that is in between Manzel Centennial Provincial Park and the Stoko Fen. Down here we have the Salmon River Alvar focal area. Um, and here we have the uh, central Napanee Plain Alvar's focal area. So this includes the um, Napanee Plain Alvar Nature Reserve and the Camden East Alvar Nature Reserve. And then we have our Millhaven Creek focal area, which is uh, all of the land pretty much that surrounds Millhaven Creek. And there's lots of reasons why the biodiversity in the Napanee Plain is just spectacular. Uh, so habitat wise, as many of us know, the Napanee Plain has these wonderful karst features. Um, and we also have beautiful river and, uh, oh, sorry, did someone have a, a question? I don't, I don't know what to do, I'm sorry. I screwed it up. Okay, um, there we go. I think everybody's muted now. Okay, so this is uh, actually the Moira River, but another example of, of a river that passes through the Napanee Plain. So lots of nice riparian areas, wetlands, uh, and then of course, alvars like you see down here. This is the Camden East Alvar. And then a whole bunch of different amazing species, uh, grassland birds being one of the sort of focal species in the area. And of course, uh, what we, we like to call it like the panda of the Napanee Plain would be the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike in a second. And so when I originally put this presentation together, I just had the Napanee Plain, but then I realized that both the Salmon and Napanee Rivers start in the Napanee Plain, but they don't end in the Napanee Plain. So they actually end in another natural area, which is the Eastern Lake Ontario Coast Natural Area. And you can see this here, and this is a huge natural area, 700 and over 740,000 um, acres. And so again, we have these focal areas where we sort of try to really focus our and prioritize our work. One being the Kingston East Creeks and Clay Plains, which is on the east side, Wolf Island being another one, uh, the Greater Tyndanaga Landscape, the Western Wetlands and Beaches, and then where we focus actually a large portion of our work in the Eastern Lake Ontario coast is down on the south shore of Prince Edward County. And biodiversity in the Eastern Lake Ontario coast, again, amazing grassland bird habitat, uh, um, excellent um, staging and breeding habitat for monarch butterflies. And then of course, these fantastic coastal wetlands that provide such amazing habitat for many coastal species. This is actually a picture of the uh, Brighton wetland, which is on Presqu'ile uh, Bay. And I also just wanted to throw in here about uh, land securement. So in the Napanee Plain in particular, we have um, sort of three big projects that we've worked on over NCC's time in the Napanee Plain. Uh, one of them up here in the top left, that's the Napanee Plain Alvar Nature Reserve, which is now something like 299.99 acres, almost to 300. Uh, and this is the habitat for the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike. So an endangered predatory songbird. Um, kids love it because it, they impale their prey on thorns and barbed wire fences and things like that. And they're critically endangered in Ontario. There's only about 40 birds remaining. So, and about half of those birds are found in the Napanee Plain and uh, four, four pairs of them usually are on, two to four pairs of them are on this property here. Uh, we also have the Camden East Alvar, which is a newer property. Um, it was a partnership with uh, the Lennox 19 Stewardship Council, uh, spearheaded by Adele Crowder, and it was actually land that was owned by Loyalist Township and they donated it uh, to NCC. And that's now our Camden East Alvar Nature Reserve. And then also Menzel Centennial Provincial Park, um, most of which was originally secured by NCC, but it's operated uh, as a uh, nature reserve class Ontario Park now. Um, but newer news and also very exciting news, you can see down here this map shows Menzel Centennial Provincial Park in the green. And this uh, yellow blob here is now what's called the uh, Hodgson Family Nature Reserve. And that um, was a new property to NCC as of just the last few months. And it's been this sort of hole 
in the side of that provincial park for uh, upwards of 20 years now. Uh, and uh, finally, we, we had a deal and um, the land is now owned by NCC. It doesn't look like it will be transferred to Ontario Parks um, anytime in the near future. So we'll continue to manage this parcel, uh, but that's a, a huge win, um, a huge win for conservation there. And it really increases the size of protected area um, of Menzel Centennial Provincial Park. And so uh, the last thing I'm gonna mention about sort of NCC related work are, is that as Susan alluded to, conservation planning is a huge part of my job especially. And so those nature reserves um, that I was just talking about, uh, which are, um, this has all been done already for those properties, but the first step when we receive a property is to do a baseline inventory for it. So that includes things like delineating what types of communities are there, looking at species at risk, invasive species, that's always a big thing on our radar, and thinking about some of the man-made features that are on the land and what the history of the property is. And once we have that initial baseline done, we can move into making a management plan for the property. So this uh, is an exercise that allows us to say, okay, here's what our, our targets are. Maybe it's like a, a forest and a, a wetland or something like that. And here's what the threats are to that forest and wetland. So it might be invasive species is, is always a threat in every property management plan, unfortunately. Uh, but also maybe something like ATV use might be another one, illegal dumping could be one. Uh, and then you rank the impact of the threats on our targets, and then we create a stewardship action plan. So that could be things like managing the invasive species, <clears throat> putting up fences or gates or something to keep ATVs out, things like that. And so, you know, we're always interested in talking to more landowners um, in these natural areas. So, you know, if you have a piece of property that you want to, to talk about, my, I'll share my contact information at the end of the, of the talk. So now getting into what we're really here to talk about, which is uh, invasive species. So I always want like to start off by just defining what invasive species are, just so we make sure that we're clear throughout the whole presentation. So invasive species are defined as non-native species whose introduction or spread negatively impacts native biodiversity. And that includes um, also the economy and our society and human health. <clears throat> and non-native species refer, can also, non-native species refers to any plant, animal, and microorganism that may have been accidentally or deliberately introduced into areas beyond their normal range. So the difference between an invasive species and a non-native species is the impact that they can have. So we can have non-native species that are not considered invasive. Sometimes you'll hear uh, invasive species referred to as alien species, introduced species or exotic species as well, but we'll just, uh, for simplicity's sake, just call them invasive species. Um, and they're not just plants. I'm obviously, like I said, very focused on plants, but you can have invasive fish, invasive invertebrates, uh, fungi, all kinds of invasive species. And just sort of broadly, invasive species can have any number of impacts. It all depends on the system that they're in, what the species is, what type of species it is. But just to sort of give a bit of an overview here, Reduced crop yield and crop value is a big one for farmers with invasive species. Uh, also uh, kind of related to that, endangering livestock. So there are some invasive species that are not good for livestock to ingest uh, or can affect things like milk production. Uh, forests that are regenerating, invasive species can be a big problem for that. Um, one example would be after a fire, for instance, um, or after some kind of disturbance, logging, et cetera, you can see a lot of uh, invasive species move in. They're very much uh, related to disturbance and, and I'll get into that in a bit as well. They can change the soil chemistry. So they can actually change things about the soil that make them that makes the soil pretty much inhospitable to other uh, nat native species. They can reduce uh, food availability, and habitat availability for different wildlife, uh, including insects, birds, mammals. They reduce uh, native plant diversity. So especially native 
invasive plant species reduce native plant diversity. And I'll talk about that pretty much with every example tonight. And they can also cause human health issues. So um, something like wild parsnip, which I know lots of people, especially in this area, are familiar with. Um, so there are direct impacts on, on humans too. And this is a picture here of my interns from, I think two summers ago, Michaela and Tegan, and um, this is at a property in Brighton. And this is actually an invasive species called Himalayan balsam, which I won't go over uh, in any detail tonight, but it's such a nice invasive species to manage because it has the shallowest roots I've ever seen and it just pulls directly out of the ground. So that looks like it was a lot of work and it was a lot of work to get a pile that big, but um, it's not very labor intensive. And one of the things I also like to do when starting to talk about invasive species is talk about the sort of economic implications of them, because I, I know most of us, you know, being members of the Friends of groups, we, we all care about the environment, but sometimes it helps to put a dollar value on it just to see just how bad of an impact these species have. And so this is actually a really neat report called the estimated expenditures on invasive species by Ontario municipalities and conservation authorities. And it's available at the invasive species center.ca. And they actually have a really nice sort of two page infographic which summarizes the report. And just these are two of the sort of take home messages from it is that uh, municipalities and conservation authorities across Ontario, it's estimated that they spend about $50.8 million per year on invasive species. And when you consider <clears throat> all the impacts that invasive species can have, the things that I just talked about, so on agriculture, healthcare, on our forests and our fisheries, uh, it's estimated to cost Ontario about 3.6 billion years or billion dollars per year. So it's pretty, it's very substantial in terms of its, its impact um, on the economy. <clears throat> and so just to start here, I want to talk a little bit about uh, zebra mussels. And when I put this talk together, I, I called it a classic example of an invasive species. And, and it is classic in, in a sense. And I didn't mean in terms of time, because zebra mussels actually have not been an issue for that long. Um, but more in terms of the course of action that they took, it was just a perfect example of an invasive species. So these guys are about two to four centimeters long. Any, I'm sure almost everybody has seen a zebra mussel before. Um, they're flat on one side and then they're kind of triangular on their other side. Um, and they are kind of black, black and brown with sort of a yellowish tinge to them, sometimes white, with those really characteristic zigzag patterns on it. And they're native to the area around and including the Black Sea. And they arrived uh, in the ballast water of ships. And they're found all throughout the Great Lakes now. And they have pretty significant impacts on aquatic uh, habitats. So they excessively <clears throat> filter water. And what this does is it decreases the food that's available for other species that are living in the lakes. It causes increased vegetation growth and also increased toxic algal bloom. So uh, they actually selectively feed on uh, algae, which is what causes these increased toxic algal blooms because they don't feed on those. And they're also an issue for recreation. Um, you see them all over that. The picture down on the bottom there is actually from the South Shore of Prince Edward County, um, just a balloon that we had picked up off the beach that's covered in zebra mussels. And there's parts of a lot of the beach there actually is just entirely zebra mussels, dead ones, but still entirely zebra mussels. And they clog um, like water intakes. Um, they're just really awful things. And you know, eradication, though, at this point of the zebra mussel would be a very difficult thing to do. Um, it would be extremely expensive. I don't even know. I don't even know if you could quantify how expensive it would be. And it's so widespread in the Great Lakes that it seems now that what the focus has shifted to is really just on prevention uh, and stopping it from spreading elsewhere to inland lakes and other bodies of water. So they've really been focusing on this whole idea of drain clean dry, which means if you're using some sort of vessel in the water, whether it be a kayak or a boat, etc, that you make sure you drain the water out of like your live wells and off of the, the boat, etc, and you clean it and you let it dry. So what that does is it stops you from 
transporting uh, invasive species like the zebra mussel into new um, habitats and also to report new sightings of it. And I'll talk at the uh, end of the presentation about how you can report new sightings of invasive species. So gypsy moth, uh, I am by no means a gypsy moth expert. In fact, I have very little experience directly dealing with gypsy moths. I've been very lucky in the sense that even over the past couple of years where we seem to be seeing higher numbers of them. Um, where I have lived and where I have worked, we haven't had this issue, uh, at least directly on these properties with gypsy moth. But I know in other NCC natural areas, it's been a huge issue. Um, out in Rice Lake, for instance, in Black Oak Savannah, there are lots of uh, Black Oaks that are being defoliated by gypsy moth. And so, but I started to learn more about gypsy moth because I recently moved closer to the front neck arch area. And I noticed that we had um, over the winter that we did have a lot of gypsy moth eggs on our trees. So this got me really intrigued in gypsy moths. And so I wanted to just quickly talk about them and summarize their history and their life cycle and um, sort of what a gypsy moth outbreak maybe is sort of caused by and, and some potential actions that we can take. So uh, gypsy moths were, introduced by uh, a French scientist in the 1880s, I think. And what he wanted to do was crossbreed the gypsy moth with the North American silkworm. So gypsy moths mainly feed on oaks, but they will feed on pretty much anything um, with the exception of red maple. Apparently they do not eat red maple, but they will eat other maples, beeches, poplars. They even eat coniferous trees like white pine, fir trees. And so he thought if he crossbred the gypsy moth with the silk, North American silkworm, which is very picky in terms of what it eats, it might come out with some sort of hybrid that would be a silk, um, produce silk, but would be a uh, would be more attuned to eating a variety of things. Uh, it turns out that that is impossible because they're in different families, uh, so that wasn't going to work. And they did escape in the late 1800s, with the first outbreak in the eastern U.S. being around 1889. And there were several other outbreaks in between then and 1951, which was sort of the capstone outbreak, which defoliated about 600,000 hectares of forest in the US. And they started using DDT after that, uh, which did work at controlling gypsy moths. But as we know, it was terrible for a number of other things, including birds, humans. Um, so that was uh, not used any longer. And it was, they were first detected in Ontario in the um, around 1969-1970. And they're found from Sault Ste. Marie to Eastern Canada now, uh, with outbreaks having occurred in 85, 91, 2002, and 2008. Um, and then in 2019, there was about 43,000 hectares that were uh, defoliated. And 2020, I still don't see the, the results for it. Um, every year there's a forest health report that comes out, but I haven't been able to get my hands on the 2021 yet. It might not be ready. So, uh, but I know that they did do aerial surveys to monitor the damage from gy gypsy moths. And so it's not quite as bad as it was when we first had outbreaks in Ontario. I believe in the 80s and 90s, they defoliated, you know, two, 300,000 hectares of forest, uh, but still 43,000 seems quite significant. And then 2021 is just sort of, you know, we're waiting to see what is going to happen right now. And so the gypsy moth spends its fall and winter as an egg mass. And you can see that pictured sort of right there in the center of the screen. And this is what I saw when I moved here around October, where these really orangey colored um, objects that are quite hairy on the sides of trees. And it didn't seem to matter. It doesn't seem to matter what tree it was on. I've seen them on Shagvar kickeries and on sugar maples and on ironwoods, they seem to be on uh, a large variety of, even on pines. Uh, and then as the winter progresses, they kind of become whiter in appearance and it looks more like glue or like somebody stuck like a piece of gum or something on the tree. They just change color a little bit. And so they spend the fall and winter as these egg masses on trees and then they emerge uh, in spring as larvae until mid-June. And this is 
what you see here, and this is them in their most uh, destructive stage. So this is when they actually start defoliating trees. So this is when they're the most dangerous. They pupate for 10 to 12 days and then emerge in mid-July to August as adults. And you can see the female is on the top here, uh, kind of a cream colored white with these wavy dark bands and these little black dots along the edges of the wings. And then the male has these very frilly antenna and is a bit darker, almost a brown orange in color. And like I said, their preferred host uh, is, is oak, but they will defoliate anything, including uh, conifer trees. And the only purpose really of a gypsy moth is to reproduce. There's no other, they, the males have no other drive to do anything except for find a female. And the females uh, are flightless. So they just kind of sit around waiting for males to find them and then lay their eggs. So, um, and they can lay thousands of eggs in these little uh, masses here. So outbreaks of gypsy moth are fairly cyclical. So you'll have some years where you see really, really high numbers of them. And that lasts for a few years, usually one, two or three years. And then the populations will crash again. Uh, and then it'll be several years until you see any noticeable damage from them. <clears throat> and there's no real, from what I understand at least, there's no real trigger that causes an outbreak to occur. So it seems to be more of a combination of different factors that just create sort of the right conditions. And some of the things that outbreaks may be associated with are the availability of hosts. So their hosts being trees. So here in our general area, that's not uh, an issue. There's plenty of hosts for them. Hot and dry springs and summers. So this spring doesn't appear to be working in our favor right now. It's quite dry and it's been quite mild. Uh, and then warmer winters with deep snow. Um, is, is good for gypsy moths because if the eggs are below, they tend to lay at least 50% of their eggs on the lower parts of trees. And if their eggs are below the snow line, it insulates them. And so they're actually more likely to survive if their eggs are below the snow line. And then also stressed hosts. So if you have trees that are stressed for some other reason, whether it be drought or maybe some kind of disease that they have, um, then that could be associated with um, them being defoliated by gypsy moths. Whereas outbreaks, and I was trying to be very careful with my wording here, I say I had, first I had sort of caused by, but this isn't really, outbreaks aren't necessarily, um, or aren't by something, I'm just going to use say outbreaks are impacted by, so temperature. So there is a fungus that occurs in the environment that kills gypsy moths, but it thrives only in cooler, wetter springs. So if you don't have a cool, wet spring, this fungus is not likely to do well, which means it's not likely to kill many gypsy moths. Low snow cover, exactly what I was saying before. So if you don't have much snow um, and the eggs are exposed to the colder temperatures of the winter, they can't survive very long past minus 25. So that could, you know, help with an outbreak. I may mean, prevent an outbreak. Uh, competition, so competition with other uh, insects, like the forest tent caterpillar, which is native. Um, if a tree gets defoliated by a forest tent caterpillar before a gypsy moth, that's not good news for a gypsy moth. And then also defense mechanisms of hosts. So if a tree gets defoliated by a gypsy moth in a given year, the next year it's likely to produce some sort of a response to that. So it may produce leaves that have more fiber, that are um, have more tannins. They're just not as nutritionally uh, valuable. So this would impact the growth of gypsy moss the following year of their caterpillars. There's also parasites, things like wasps, for instance, may parasitize and kill um, gypsy moth caterpillars and also predation. So birds and mice, squirrels really enjoy eating gypsy moths, especially when they're in their, when they're pupating. So um, that is sort of another, I guess, natural uh, sort of control for gypsy moths. And there's also a virus that exists um, that builds up in populations and spreads between individuals. 
And so the ones that I have asterisks beside are sort of the things that naturally keep the population in check. And generally, when the population does crash uh, after an outbreak, it's because of a combination of, of those things, just the, the right favorable conditions that um, really hurts the population. There are things that um, people, there are methods that you can try to control gypsy moths. Um, there's the option of injecting um, trees with um, something called triazin. It's a botanical injectable and it's made of um, the seeds of the neem tree. And what it does is it, so these are injected into the base of a tree and it provides the a uh, tree with one year of, uh, of protection from <clears throat> not just gypsy moss, but anything, uh, any insects that would defoliate the, the tree. Um, and it prevents their, the caterpillars from growing any larger, so they end up dying. But again, this would be, it's very expensive and it would be very hard to do something like that at a large scale. So um, municipalities, um, I'm thinking of York in particular, they do this on what they think of as high value trees. So ones that are like a lot, maybe ones that are heritage trees or that are quite old or quite big, some something of high value to them, they may treat those trees with this. But again, it, it would have to be done yearly um, for it to be effective. And there's also uh, BTK, which is more commonly used now as an aerial uh, spray, and it is a naturally occurring um, bacteria, um, Bacillus some something, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Uh, it is naturally occurring bacteria that's found in the soil and uh, it can be sprayed on the foliage of individual trees and it's very good at killing gypsy moths. Uh, it doesn't impact humans, it doesn't impact um, other in non-target insects, birds, etc. However, it is not specific to gypsy moths, so it will kill anything in the Lepidoptera family. So any moth or caterpillar or any moth or butterfly caterpillar, it would kill. So it's very important um, in using that to consider that, but to also consider things like timing and the location of spraying. Um, it's, it's very, it, it can be challenging uh, when you have other species that you could impact as well. And just to finish here and talking about um, gypsy moths, there are a couple of things that you can do on your own property for gypsy moths. Um, but it's important to remember that none of these actions, so egg scraping or this burlap trap that I'll describe, would really have an impact on the gypsy moth population itself. What you would be doing is more, you're doing this more for the health of the tree than for anything. Uh, and also important to note that most trees can survive and will survive three years of being defoliated by gypsy moths. Um, when trees do die because of gypsy, uh, that have been defoliated by a gypsy moth, it's generally because the tree was stressed in some other way already. So whether that be drought or it had some sort of a disease or injury of some kind, it's generally gypsy moth combined with something else that kills it. So the trees generally are quite resilient to it. And so the first thing, and I actually tried doing this, and it's not as easy as it sounds because bark is not flat by any means, but to go around uh, and try to scrape any egg masses that you can see off of your trees and into a bucket of really hot soapy water. And I did this a little while ago and you should always wear gloves when you're doing anything with gypsy moths because they have hairs on the caterpillars, but also on the outside of those egg masses that have really bad reactions to human skin. So you always wanna wear gloves. And you can just take something like a putty knife or um, anything really with a straight edge and scrape the eggs off of the tree and into that bucket and you just let it sit there for a couple of days. Uh, the burlap trap, I've never tried this, but I hope to try it this year. You can take a piece of burlap and you can wrap it around the tree trunk like you see in the an image one here. And importantly, this would be done when they're in their larva stage, so when they're caterpillars. Uh, and, and you can see here in the second one, it actually doesn't show up that well, but you tie a string sort of around the um, middle of the burlap, and then you fold that top part down. And so during the day, 
gypsy moth caterpillars tend to go down on the trees, one because of shade, but also to avoid predators. Uh, and so they'll seek shelter in that little flap of the burlap here. And you'd have to go out every day and check and you would basically hand pull off the caterpillars and put them into um, the same thing that you did with the eggs. So a hot soapy water and let them sit there. That's one um, way, that's another sort of way to deal with them. And I know that lots of places have tried this. Um, I, I know some people have talked about things like sticky traps, um, which do work, but unfortunately you catch a lot of other things on sticky traps that you put on trees. Um, and there's also some sort of pheromone trap, but I, I don't believe it's approved for, for use um, here yet. Alrighty, so uh, now on to invasive plant species. And I'm going to talk about several different invasive plant species. And I also wanted to say that I did get a lot of emails from people um, before this asking specific questions about invasive plant species on their properties. And I apologize that I haven't had a chance to get back to anybody yet. I'm hoping this will provide some, some light to some of you, but I will try my best to get back to everybody. And, and how, what I want people to get out of this section in particular is that there already are, exist something called best management practices in Ontario for managing invasive plant species. And it's such a great tool uh, to become familiar with. They're freely available online to you. And uh, it actually will help you work through your specific invasion. And um, it'll give you the different options you have for controlling something based on your um, specific location and, and how bad your invasion is. And that's sort of these best management practices are what I follow every day in making decisions about managing invasive species. Um, so I hope that they're just as useful to you as they uh, have been to me. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about <clears throat> garlic mustard. So this is an invasive species that you're probably, if you have it, you're seeing it come up now. I'm certainly seeing it coming up um, all over the place. So garlic mustard uh, is native <clears throat> to Europe and it's a biennial. So it um, grows in its first year, like this image in the bottom left here. So they're like these kidney shaped sort of basil leaves, uh, a little rosette and it overwinters as that rosette and its leaves remain green through the winter. So it's really ready to go come the next year in the spring. It's got quite shallow roots um, and its leaves are scented just like its name suggests, so like garlic. So if you were to touch its leaves and crush them between your fingers, it has a really sharp garlic smell. Um, when it matures in its second year, so it, in its second year, it's already got these basil leaves and it shoots up, um, it bolts and it flowers. It gets these little tiny, very pretty actually, little white leaves. Um, and then these toothed, um, these toothed leaves along its stem. And it spreads, unlike a lot of other invasive species that we'll talk about, it spreads only by seed, but it can produce up to 105,000 seeds per meter squared. So it has an incredible capacity for seed production and its seeds can last a long time in the seed bank as well. Uh, it was first introduced as a, a food source or potentially even as a, an herbal medicine and it escaped cultivation in the late 1800s. So it's been around for quite a while. I think its first record actually in Kingston was 1898. So it's been, uh, it's been a long time here. Uh, it likes a variety of habitats, but like many invasive species, it prefers disturbed sites. So things like the edges of fields, um, the edges of woodlands, um, trails, uh, railways, gardens. It prefers limestone. Um, it can grow in full shade. It doesn't need almost any sun, but it can also grow with some sun. Um, but it also doesn't, it's complicated because it doesn't necessarily need disturbance either. So you can go into old growth forests that haven't been disturbed uh, and see garlic mustard growing there. Um, there's some studies that suggest that gar the invasion of garlic mustard may be uh, facilitated by non-native earthworms. So as forests with um, low 
leaf litter, um, those would be ones that have an abundance of earthworms to quickly break down the fallen leaves that fall onto the forest floor that might make them ideal uh, sites for establishment of this species. And it has sort of this advanced retreat growth pattern. So um, you might see it really abundantly in one year and then not see it again, and then it'll uh, come back with, with vengeance again. And there's many impacts of garlic mustard. The first, of course, being that it displaces native species. And like I said, it's growing now. So the type of species that it's displacing are those really beautiful spring ephemerals. Um, so things like trilliums or spring beauties. Uh, it's allelopathic. So this means that it actually exudes chemicals into the soil and it prevents other plants from growing, or growing around it, although it can still grow in it. It's very quick growing. So like I said, it has that rosette in going into its second year and it's early too. Uh, it um, is a viral host. So the garlic mustard itself is actually a host to many viruses, including things like um, cabbage, black ring spot, uh, the cucumber mosaic virus. And so that can negatively impact horticultural and agricultural plants. And also it's, it's not good for livestock. So um, for instance, when cows eat it, uh, they do produce milk that is sort of tainted with garlic. So it's not usable. Uh, so it's really bad if cows eat it. I mean, some may find that uh, appealing. I, I wouldn't, but maybe somebody would. Garlic milk, I'm not too sure. And so there's lots of different ways to control garlic mustard. You can pull it out of the ground. That's the easiest way. It actually has shallow roots. It's quite easy to pull. Um, but you know, for bigger infestations, you could cut it, you could mow it, clip its flower heads. There are chemical options to control garlic mustard. Um, there's some biological controls that are being explored with some, some weevils. Uh, and, and also controlled burns is another way to, con to uh, get rid of garlic mustard. But before you do any of those control measures, and this is what the best management practices walk you through, is you need to think about certain things. You need to make uh, observations about the invasion on your property before you decide what you're going to do. So you need to think about the density of the area that's infested. So how many plants actually are there? How big is the area that's infested? What point is the plant at in its life cycle? So for instance, Garlic mustard is great to pull before it flowers or even maybe when it's flowering, but once it's gone to seed, sometimes pulling it can actually be more dangerous than good because you risk spreading its seeds elsewhere. And also to think about the surrounding plants. So are there species at risk plants around it? Are there other dangerous plants around it that might be dangerous to you like poison ivy? Uh, so lots of things to consider. And I always just include a note down at the bottom too, but again, this is in the best management practice about disposal. So um, when you're disposing of garlic mustard, generally the best thing to do is to bag it in black plastic and then you leave it in the sun for at least one week. And that sort of is a way of, I guess, solarizing it. So it kills the, the seeds and the roots of the, the plants importantly too. If you just pull a garlic mustard and drop it where you pulled it, I have seen it happen before where it, where it will attempt to reroot itself into the soil. They're very uh, aggressive plants. So you always wanna make sure you dispose of, of garlic mustard and any uh, invasive species properly. Dog strangling vine is a bit of a less well-known um, invasive species. It is a little bit more uh, conspicuous. So it's harder to notice. Although once you actually go searching for it, it's quite easy to notice it. It was introduced uh, either horticulturally or accidentally, I'm not quite sure, in the late 1800s. It's native to the eastern parts of Europe and it is a perennial, so it will live for several years. It's got these, as you can see in the picture here, these really big um, opposite smooth leaves. And the leaves, it's interesting because the leaves are actually the biggest in the middle of the plant. So often you think the leaves would be biggest at the bottom, but they're biggest in the middle. So they go small to biggest to smaller again at the, at the bottom. And they can vary in color quite a bit. So in this picture here, 
the leaves are a really bright, vibrant green, but they can be very dark green. And I often notice they're dark green in areas where they get a lot of shade. And they can also be really lime yellow. And that often, I noticed at least happens when they get a lot of sun or they seem to be stressed for water. They have really beautiful flowers. They're not very showy, they're tiny, but they're this really beautiful sort of crimson red color and they're star shaped. And they have seeds that are dispersed by the wind um, from these seed pods here. So you, I think probably everyone's familiar with what a milkweed pod and seed looks like. These um, plants are in the milkweed family. They have pods as well, but they're very skinny pods. And their, lee, and, and their seeds actually look very similar to milkweed seeds. They have that brown seed with the white fluffy pappus attached to it, dispersed by the wind, uh, but they're also much smaller. And again, you see, Dog strangling vine in a wide range of habitats, often associated with limestone, but you see it. I mean, if you go, if you go, if you've ever been to Toronto on the GO train, it is one of the main things that you see along the sides of the railway is dog strangling vine. Um, and often roadside ditches are just filled with it. So impacts of dog strangling vine, um, again, it impacts native and especially rare plants. Uh, it it's really heavy shade, which is a big, a big thing. So they, you can see up in this photo here, that's actually in Prince Edward County, but um, this man in the orange here is walking through what is an entire, everything in the understory there is dog strangling vine. And it's very hard to walk through it uh, without tripping also because it is a vine, but nothing else can grow through that like really, really thick carpet of dog strangling vine. And so again, it's allelopathic, just like garlic mustard is. It exudes that chemical into the soil that makes the soil um, not hospitable for other plants. And it decreases habitat per species. So if you can imagine in this picture at the bottom here, this is you know a nice sort of um, open shrubland, grassland kind of area. And it's gonna be very difficult for something like a grassland bird to make a nest in something that grows um, that twines around things and grows into a really uh, dense mat. And then it does, it, it is potentially, it does have an impact on monarchs themselves. So the, the, the literature on this, it can go either way. And, um, but, so like I said, dog strangling vine is a member of the milkweed family. So um, there have been cases where monarchs have laid their eggs on dog strangling vine instead of on, milkweed. And when their larvae emerge, the plant is um, too toxic for them, so they die. Um, I haven't, I've only seen this happen once. I don't know if it's a, a widespread phenomenon, but it certainly is possible for it to happen. And there's definitely records of it happening. Uh, they can suppress <clears throat> tree growth, especially of young seedlings because of a combination of the shade and the allelopathy, it can be toxic in larger amounts to wide wildlife uh, and it can create problems for recreation. So like I was saying, if you can imagine trying to walk or hike through an area that was um, totally infested with dog strangling vine, uh, it would be very hard to move through there. And there are, uh, again, several control measures and things like digging it up uh, it has quite an intense root system. So, uh, and it can, um, it doesn't only spread by seed. So it can spread via um, fragments of its root as well. And it can send up sort of other shoots or clones. So um, it makes it a bit more problematic to manage than garlic mustard is. But you can try digging it, mowing, clipping, uh, tarping, pulling it, removing the seed pods and, and also um, chemical control. And just to mention too, chemical control in almost all of these cases needs to be done by somebody who's licensed to do so. So for the most part, you can't control these plants yourself. You would need to uh, contact a licensed um, exterminator to, to do so. And then again, thinking about what you need to consider before you even start controlling the species. So the density, the uh, size of the infested area, the point in its life cycle, and what plants are actually growing around it. And disposal of this species is similar in a bag that's black plastic, 
leave it in the sun, but this time up for three weeks, up to three weeks, because um, they are a little bit hardier in terms of uh, how long they'll survive in that bag compared to, to garlic mustard. Okay, and then wild parsnip. So wild parsnip is a, a big one in our area for sure. Uh, Eastern Ontario, especially in the last 10 years or so, it seems, this species has really, really taken off. Uh, it was native to Europe and Asia, likely arrived here quite a long time ago um, and introduced as a crop. So its root is actually edible, um, much like a parsnip would be, it is a parsnip. Um, and it's a short-lived perennial. So I always thought that wild parsnip was a biennial, um, but it's actually, it can live for more than, than two years, but it does grow in a rosette in its first year. And it has, so once you see wild parsnip leaves, you can't unsee them because they actually are quite different than, um, than most other leaves that you'll, you'll see. So they have these really sawtoothed edges on them. So if you think about what a saw would look like, that's what the edges of all of its leaves look like. And they have huge basil leaves, massive things. Um, when they bolt after their first year, they have um, hollow stems, big, big stems, thick stems that are hollow. And they have these really deep grooves in them that you can see really well in this picture here. Kind of looks a little bit like celery, I guess, now that I look at it. Uh, and then once they flower, they get these flat topped yellow flower clusters. And you probably recognize them from uh, on the sides in the middle, especially the 401 in ditches all over uh, the place. They really love uh, disturbed areas and they can grow in anything from shade to full sun. They don't really care. Um, ditches, railways, dump sites, abandoned, um, recently abandoned areas, things like um, maybe sand quarries that were abandoned, waste disposal sites, trails, um, but also cultivated fields. I'm seeing them more and more in cultivated fields now. Um, meadows, grasslands, alvars, you see them in a, in a wide range of places, not so much in like closed canopy forest or woodland, but on the edges, certainly. And they can be quite tall, so anywhere from a half meter to a meter and a half. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to see wild parsnip that's taller than, than I am. And again, it outcompetes native uh, vegetation, especially because it likes to grow in open areas. In particular, it uh, will displace a lot of really valuable pollinator plants. Uh, also, again, it's life cycle, so it, you know, has that rosette ready by the time it moves into its um, second year of life. So it's kind of ready to go ahead of everything else uh, and its height too. So it can cast quite a shadow and create um, shade. It does reduce forage quality um, and it does have health risks to humans. So if uh, you, if your skin comes in contact with wild parsnip and then your skin is exposed to the sun, uh, you can get these really bad, almost chemical like burns and blisters on you from the plant and I, and they can be really, really dangerous. So um, when doing anything with this plant, it's important that you always have the right PPE on and always just anywhere you are, be aware that it could be there as well. It doesn't have to be flowering. It doesn't have to have bolted. It can just be its leaves. Uh, it could be after it flowers. You have to be very, uh, very careful around it. And there's lots of different ways to control it again. So um, mowing it, tilling it, tarping it, pulling it, burning it, treating it with some sort of herbicide are all options. Um, one of the things I'll mention here, especially with mowing of these species, including dog shangling vine, when you mow it, down, you have to remember that that is not, you can't just do it once and it's over and done with. So a lot of these things require repeated, um, repeated treatments, because I'm sure you've seen on roadsides, they'll get mown down and they'll start to flower again. And they'll only be, you know, like this big when they're flowering. So you have to, you have to really, if you're going to manage it, you have to really invest time into it and continuously mow it so that it can't reflower again. And also just mentioned here too, that tarping, or solarization can is frequently recommended, and it is in the best management practices as well. 
But when you solarize something or tarp it, you put a tarp over it and let it sit there and the sun essentially cooks it. The same thing as you do when you dispose of some of these invasive species in a black garbage bag. But it's also really important to consider what else you might be killing when you're solarizing it. So things like valuable microorganisms that might be in the soil, uh, insects, things like that um, would die as well. And again, all the same considerations as before, but also um, safety is another uh, big consideration when you're thinking about managing wild parsnip. And again, it's the same sort of disposal of the species. So leave it in place. Um, so you can leave it, this one in place. So if it's not flowering and doesn't have seeds, you can just, you know, if you pulled it out or something like that with your proper PPE, you could just leave it there. Um, if it's not too far along in its life cycle, but generally black plastic for, for one week would, would take care of wild parsnip. And because I anticipated that we'd have quite a few people uh, attending that may own property along water, and just given who's hosting the, the talk tonight, I wanted to include the species because it's not as well known and it is so beautiful that you would wish that it wasn't uh, invasive, but unfortunately it is. Uh, and there is a brand new best management practice that just came out in 2020 for, for the species. And this is flowering rush. And it arrived uh, in the, um, at some point by 1900 via one of those sort of typical invasive pathways, whether it be packing material, ballast water, uh, escaping from um, horticulture. It's a perennial and uh, it can grow in either emergent or submergent uh, conditions. So it can be um, almost totally underwater or only a little bit underwater. It, it really tends to prefer though, like fluctuating water levels. So it really, where I've seen it the most is on the shores of, uh, in coastal wetlands on the shores of Lake Ontario where the, the water level can fluctuate quite a bit throughout the season. It has these super distinct leaves. You can see it in this top picture here. It's, they're, they're triangular uh, in shape. And the leaves can be really rigid if the plant is mostly out of water, but they can be quite elastic um, if they're in water and sort of wavy and, and move quite a bit. The plant flowers from June to September, uh, and it has these really, really beautiful umbrella-shaped umbels that have these white and, and pink flowers. And um, there's two reproductive types. Um, so there's one repro there's one type that has two sets of chromosomes and that type can reproduce via seed, via rhizomes and via these little bulbs uh, on the root. But there's also um, another one that has three sets of uh, chromosomes that's sexually sterile. So it will not produce via, re reproduce via seed. And I don't know how you even tell them apart by looking at them. I'm not sure if you even can, but just to be aware that um, you can't count on them not reproducing by seed because there's one, one um, that one reproductive type that does and one that doesn't. <clears throat> and flowering rush can have many impacts. Um, it can displace native vegetation and I have never seen a, a really bad infestation of flowering rush, um, but it certainly is possible. And there's lots of other places around the world that have seen really bad. And I'm sure there are places in, uh, that, I, that I just haven't seen around here that might have them, but flowering rush has always been sort of an afterthought. Like we're always more concerned about Phragmites or purple loosestrife or something like that, but it's becoming more of a, of a concern now. It forms, it can form really dense mats, uh, especially in littoral zones and alter fish habitat in doing that uh, because it can grow so densely. <clears throat> and it can also uh, impact the water temperature because of those dense mats. And then uh, there have been some cases where it's clogged drainage ditches quite, uh, quite aggressively. And there's a few uh, ways that you can control flowering rush. So you can use a cut and drown technique. So when it is growing in water, you can cut it below the water level um, and basically like, cut off its um, oxygen supply and drown it. 
Um, you can also cut its seed heads off, which will stop it from spreading via seed if it's able to. And you can dig it up if that's, if that's possible as well. But again, thinking about the safety because often it's in water, the timing of it, the density size, how disturbed the area is, et cetera, is important before making a decision about how you will uh, control it. And disposing of it, it's fine to just leave it above the high water mark on dry land because it can't grow um, on dry land. But you could bag it if you if you wanted to and remove it if you were worried about um, about something moving it back to the water, for instance. And finally, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, common reed or Phragmites. And so. Um, Back in 2005, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada called Phragmites Canada's worst invasive plant. And this was in 2005. And, you know, it's 2021 now. And I don't think Phragmites was nearly as widespread as it was in 2005, as it has spread in the last 16 years. So that is saying something that they knew it was Canada's worst invasive plant before it even got close to the spread that it is today. And you can see just how massive this plant is here um, with this picture of this woman standing next to it. That is a huge stand of Phragmites or, or common reed. And so it's native to Eurasia, introduced in the 1800s again via packing material, and now it's widespread. Uh, it grows all over the place. Uh, it's up to five meters tall, so it can be very tall, and it has a hollow stem. And there's multiple ways it spreads. It spreads via um, its roots, but it also spreads via seed. Uh, and its seeds can be, because um, it often grows in areas where it gets a lot of wind. So like along like Ontario, for instance, they can uh, blow away, but they can also be transported through water. Uh, and when you see this plant, it's um, got these really flat leaves that are actually very sharp on the edges. So if you're ever touching Phragmites, be very aware that they will slice your hands like they're paper, like you're getting paper cuts so easily. Um, and their leaves are at really sharp 45 uh, degree angles. And then the plants are just sort of flowering in this picture here, but um, they get these really dense fluffy seed heads uh, in the fall. And they're actually quite beautiful, um, but they have, you know, tens of thousands of seeds per head. And actually, so you think about how big this species is, especially, you know, if you think about that first picture here. But the really, really wild part about Phragmites is that 80% of its biomass is below ground. So when you think about how big it is above ground, that's only 20% of the size of the plant. So 80% of its biomass is in its roots. It has huge root systems. So it, you know, that that's a pretty incredible plant. And we do have two types of Phragmites. So it's important before you make any decision about managing any Phragmites you might have on your property to think about that fact that we do have a native Phragmites um, that is different from the invasive Phragmites. And this chart here tries to outline a little bit of what those differences may be. Uh, there's a, a big study that's been going on that's looking to see if there are hybrids between the two, because even when you use this chart, sometimes not every, every plant that you come across is going to clearly fit into one side of this chart or the other. Generally, for the most part, it would. Um, but I don't think they have, at least on NCC properties where we submitted data, we didn't have any, any hybrids. Um, so native Phragmites. Um, leaf, so the leaf sheaths, the leaf, you imagine you have the stem of the plant right here, and you have a leaf coming off of it, like in this picture here. The sheath is what's sort of below the point where the leaf connects to the stem. And if they, if you pull on that leaf and it come, and that part below where it connects to the stem comes off really easily, it's likely native Phragmites. Whereas if it adheres really tightly below the leaf, it's probably invasive. Native tends to be mixed into communities, um, whereas invasive Phragmites tends to be um, grow more in a, in a dense monoculture. Native has a really smooth, shiny, and often purplish colored stem, whereas invasive Phragmites has a really rough, dull stem that's kind of a, a dull green 
to, to brown color later in the year. And the color of the foliage actually is quite different. It's very difficult to tell that though, if you don't have a piece of native and invasive Phragmites side by side. But when, when you do, you'll notice that the invasive Phragmites is quite bluish in color, whereas the um, native one is more of a brown yellow uh, co color. Um, ligules and gloom. So these are really sort of nitpicky characteristics that you mostly look at with a, um, like a hand lens or something. Um, the glooms being part of the, the flowering structure and the ligules being, if you were to pull that leaf down a little bit and look at the tissue that's connected to the stem, that would be the ligule. So they tend to be longer in native ones and shorter in invasive ones. The flower heads of um, native Phragmites are quite sparse. So those fluffy seed heads that they get in the fall are very um, thin and sort of wispy in comparison to the really dense full ones of invasive Phragmites. And then native has quite a flexible stem. So if you bend it, um, it doesn't tend to, to snap, whereas the invasive one um, does, it's quite rigid. And then also you tend to see native Phragmites being not very aggressive and invasive being quite aggressive. However, um, you can see native Phragmites being aggressive as well. And for those that are familiar with like Menzel Centennial Provincial Park, for instance, if you go down sort of towards where the fen is at the end of the boardwalk, you'll see a lot of Phragmites. And we actually did submit that Phragmites to the genetic um, testing program and it is native Phragmites. And it looks like native Phragmites, it does check the vast majority of boxes on this side, but it is uh, behaving a little bit more aggressively than you would expect it to. Uh, if you've been there, I'm sure you've seen it sort of starting to hang over the end of the boardwalk there. And just to illustrate with a couple of pictures, here's that big invasive uh, fluffy head on the left side. And then you see, you can see when they're side by side, the native one looks quite, you know, quite a bit different. And looking at the stem too, invasive, that greenish, dull green brown color. And you do get that really dark red uh, stem on the native ones, but more towards the bottom half of the stem. So don't look at the, the top part of the plant, but always look more towards the bottom. And it can have, Phragmites can have so many impacts on um, so many different habitats. So it can change things it, well, it displaces native plants, of course. Uh, it displaces native creatures. So if you have a coastal marsh where you might see things like least bitterns or king rails, for instance, uh, this, really, this species really alters that habitat for them. Even for things like turtles moving through Phragmites that grows in a dense stand, it can be quite difficult. Uh, it can change hydrology and drainage because it grows, it just is so much biomass in, and it you know, will jam itself into any space it can fit in. It can cause physical and structural damage to things like docks, um, other water features. And it is a big fire hazard, especially because you'll see it still, it's, it's de dead standing in the, in the winter. So you have this huge amount of really, really dead dry biomass that sits above ground in the winter. So that can be a fire hazard. Uh, it can impair sight lines. So if you think about Phragmites growing and they always mow it um, in, on the four, or for the most part, they mow it on the, the middle and the sides of the 401 because it can get so tall that it could be, um, uh, it could impair people's sight. It can cause complications with construction and then loss of productivity um, of things like agricultural areas, and then it can block access to important areas, things like water um, refill places for, for uh, fire trucks or fire hydrants. And there's lots of different ways to control Phragmites, whether that be through selective cutting and spading, uh, chemical, you can flood it in some cases, um, and also try that sort of cut and drown technique that I talked about before, mulching it, burning it, and also, so common reed or Phragmites has a new best management practice. It had one before and they redid it in 2020 and it's a massive 70 page document, but it is very informative. And it's the first time I've seen this revegetation uh, option included. So that would be sort of trying to outcompete it by planting other things that, um, that would grow and outcompete it. And again, 
lots of important considerations, including things like uh, what vectors are there to continue to, to spread it in the area, how wet the area is, what local species at risk might be in the area. And in terms of disposal, you can bag it um, and you can actually burn it as well. Um, but you'd want to check sort of what your, your local uh, guidelines might suggest or your local waste management might suggest in terms of, of getting rid of it. <clears throat> And so I've talked about these best management practices so much, and this is where you can find them. If you go to ontarioinvasiveplants.ca um, under resources and then best management practices, you'll see all their best management practice series here, including these new ones from 2020, uh, or new and or updated ones <clears throat> from 2020. So I encourage everybody to check those out. And in the best management practices, they include these invasive species control decision-making tools. So you wanna think about what your objective is. So this chart is for garlic mustard here. So uh, you wanna think about what your objective is. And then this chart will help you uh, sort of figure out and how to prioritize importantly, what you do. So when you're setting priorities to manage invasive species, you want to think about keeping areas free of invasive species that already are free of invasive species. That's a really important thing. Um, but sometimes focusing on satellite populations might have a really big invasion of garlic mustard in one area. And then, you know, 20 feet away, you have just a few plants. So you want to really make sure those satellite populations are, are taken care of. Um, maybe focusing on sensitive areas or areas with sensitive species is, is a priority. And also focusing on you know, dispersal pathways. So how is it moving around? So this chart here, you know, is garlic mustard present? Well, we'll say yes. And then it'll ask, is the population small or new? And if we said yes, it would say undertake control as soon as appropriate. Um, uh, whereas if we said no, it might, could say, well, the population is, is large and well-established. It may take time. And then it'll ask you other questions like, are there important features at this site? So rare species or communities. If you said yes, well, focus on protecting the important features with control efforts in these areas. Whereas if there wasn't, it would say, focus your time on the dispersal pathways instead. So it does help you, you know, based on what your situation is, work through those uh, different scenarios. And so for example here, <clears throat> we'll just say that somebody owns uh, this two acre woodlot, but behind their home um, along the Salmon River, and they noticed what, they think are 10 small garlic mustard rosettes growing along their walking path that they share with their neighbor. So what should they do? So the first thing you want to do, confirm that it is indeed garlic mustard that's growing. And the nice thing about the best management practice is that most of them have what they call the lookalike section. So if you think you have garlic mustard, but you're not quite sure, maybe it's creeping Charlie, which is another thing uh, that another species that kind of looks like garlic mustard, you could confirm the identification. And then if you have multiple populations and sites, you would use that uh, decision making tool there to help you prioritize it. Uh, and then use the control measure tables. This is an example of one from the garlic mustard best management practice to help you choose the best, best control method. So we know she only has 10 plants or thinks she only has 10 plants. So it's a low density, one to 50 plants or less than 10% cover and they're isolated. Uh, to one area. So here are what it suggests that you do. So you could pull it, you could mow it, and you could, or you could use a chemical control. Um, let's say she doesn't want to spend money and hire an exterminator, and it's not necessary really for 10 plants. So um, she's going to choose to pull it. And there, and then it will walk you through each one of those different control methods that you that you choose. So yeah, she'd read about the control method, perform the control method and dispose of it properly and then continue control and or monitoring as needed for at least five years to ensure that nothing comes up. There isn't a seed bank for the species. So you're not gonna see garlic mustard popping up again. And then importantly also consider whether restoration is needed. So in her case, the answer is probably no, they don't take up a lot of space, but if you pulled one whole hectare of garlic mustard, well, that leaves one whole hectare of bare ground for things to grow, uh, other invasive species or other garlic mustard plants. So you might need to plant something native to, to take over the area. Uh, and finally, to talk about a little bit about invasive species reporting. So there's a wonderful website called Edmap. 
Maps Ontario. So this is the early detection and distribution mapping system. And what you can do is if you find invasive species on your property, anywhere really, you can report them using the system. They have a new app for smartphones, which is very handy. Um, but you can also report it on by using the website. Uh, and there's also a number you can call uh, if you don't have access to a computer as well. And so I just did a random search for wild parsnip. And when you look at this area, so we have, you know, the Napanee River and the, and the Salmon River pictured here, um, there's not a whole lot of data on wild parsnip in the area on EdMaps. And I, I know there's more wild parsnip than is represented on this map. So I just think that most people don't know about this site yet. Um, but this is sort of what you would see if you looked up uh, any given species on the website and you can see um, positive identification. So when you submit uh, a, an observation, somebody does confirm whether or not it was wild parsnip that you saw. Um, so there are positive observations, negative observations, ones that didn't end up being wild parsnip, and then ones that have been treated and, and populations that have been eradicated. So it's, it's an excellent resource. And, and I would really encourage you to check out the, the EdMaps Ontario uh, website. And the last thing I'll talk about uh, being cognizant of the time is that uh, what can you do for invasive species? So the first thing is to learn more, which everybody uh, is here to do tonight. Uh, know your invasive species. So actually get out there and look at what's on your property and, and see if you can identify any. Think about how they got there. Is there something that you're doing? Uh, are you, you know, going to all these different places with the same equipment and then spreading the seeds when you get home? Uh, and then practicing prevention of some of those, uh, for some of those pathways of introduction. Report invasive species. That's another important one. That number to report them uh, is right there. Develop a plan for your property using the best management practices. Uh, and then if you want to help out with invasive species just in your general area, um, NCC does have a really great conservation volunteer program where you can come out and actually get hands-on experience managing invasive species. The program is not uh, happening right now because of, of COVID-19 restrictions, but once it is up and running again, uh, that's a great way to start getting your hands dirty. And this is a great resource here available free on the internet is a landowner's guide to managing and controlling invasive plants in Ontario. It uh, works really well hand in hand with the best management practices. Uh, and all of these uh, here at the bottom, which maybe I'll get Susan to pass around with the link to the recording are different sort of resources that you can use, including the Invasive Plant Council, the Invasive Species Centre, uh, OFAH's uh, Ontario Invading Species Awareness Program, Ontario Nature, and the Ontario government all have a whole lot of excellent uh, resources for you to help make decisions for, for your property. And this is my contact info here. So if you do want to follow up about anything uh, from tonight's presentation, feel free uh, to shoot me an email and I will uh, get back to you as, as quickly as, as I possibly can. Well, thank you, thank you very you much. Amanda, uh, I'm Stephen Moore. i am uh, been tasked with uh, handling the questions <clears throat> again, and uh, you already have a whole number of uh, number of thank yous. Um, the one of the first questions was the name of the app, and Lawrence has um, put the name of the app and the website in the chat box, so you can go there. Just a reminder as well that. A link to this recording will be on the FSR website, so you can go back and review it because there's lots of great information. Um, I'll, I'm going to kind of go by species here, and I guess I'll okay. start. I'll start at the end with Phragmites. One question was: After you bag, and this may apply to bagging many of the other plants you talked about after the designated period to let it sit in the sun. Then what do you do with it? Right, so then <clears throat> the best thing that you can do is just dispose of it at your uh, <clears throat> local waste disposal site, but you always want to contact them first to see how they prefer that you um, dispose of it. I, I know that some people say that you can compost it after that. I'd be very wary to do that. I'm just so scared that I would spread more invasive species. So, you know, <clears throat> for instance, when we do our invasive species removal at the Camden East Alvar, we leave the bags out for three weeks or whatever in the sun. Okay. And then great. we contacted the, the local waste disposal site for direction. 
There also was a question regarding Phragmites about the, uh, there was a trial, I believe in Ottawa of Chinese moths to control Phragmites. And I know it's pretty dicey to introduce one foreign species to control another one. Usually you end up with lions. Uh, but uh, do, you, uh, do you have any information on that trial or has that been uh, canceled due to the uh, pandemic? So as far as I know, the trial is still ongoing. I actually met last summer with the researchers for the trial. Um, they were looking for sites to release uh, the biocontrol and test it. And the last thing I heard about it was, of course, with most biocontrols in our area are, are that they're having trouble surviving the winter, which is usually mm. what happens. Um, so I don't have any updated information on that, but it is still it is still ongoing and it's been ongoing for at least 10 years, this biocontrol study. OK. Um, uh, also, with when you dispose of gypsy moth eggs after placing them in hot, soapy water, what what's the what's the best way to do, you know, to take care of that pail of water? As far as I know, if you, after you've let it sit for a few days, you could just dump it out wherever the soap wouldn't harm something. Like I put mm. ours on our driveway. Right. Okay. Um, and there was another question. There are large woody vines entangling many trees on our property. It sounds to me like a wild grape, but uh, what would those be? Is it possible to identify those? Uh, if you have a picture, you're welcome to email it to me and I can take a look. But my guess is that it's what you said, Stephen. It's probably grapes. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. With respect to gypsy moth, is one person asked, is it possible to burn off the eggs without harming the tree or I suppose starting a forest fire? <laughs> yeah. That is a great <laughs> question. I have never heard of that before. Um, so the fact, and I've I've read a lot of stuff about managing gypsy moss, and I haven't heard that. So I think I would probably uh, avoid doing that. I, I know it's kind of, it is quite disgusting, actually. I've done it to have to scrape the eggs off, um, but that's probably your safest bet. Like you said, we don't need to start any uh, forest fires. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, I understand that some fish and ducks will feed on zebra mussels. Is there any possibility that that will eventually be a natural control? I, I mean, I guess it could be. I know, like, for instance, um, I was just doing a bunch of work with a group on mute swans, which are invasive species as well. Um, mm -hmm. And they do end up eating zebra mussels, but generally they eat them from what I know, at least by accident. So they eat them, you know, while they're eating other vegetation and such. So I doubt that they'd ever be able to eat enough zebra mussels that it would actually, you know, make a significant dent in the population. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We, uh, there was a question that might be about invasive people. I'm not sure. It's uh, wondering why barbed wire on the perimeter fence uh, was not put around the Napanee Alvar property. Right. I think, I mean, that would have been ideal. Barbed wire isn't great for a lot of other species, but it would, uh, Shrike certainly would, would love it. I think it wasn't put up because the fence was already there when we got the property and before it was even known that that shrikes were there. Uh -huh. um, the, good, the good news is though that there's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of prickly ash and hawthorn, et cetera, on the property. So they don't have any shortage of natural thorns to use. Ah, okay. And actually that's a great segue because there was one question on prickly ash and another question on buckthorn. Um, I don't think either one are non-native, but they certainly seem to be invasive. I know there's a buckthorn root puller, which sounds like a <laughs> terrific tool, uh, but do you have any recommendations for buckthorn and or prickly ash? Right, okay, so buckthorn uh, is invasive uh, and there is a best management practice for buckthorn. So I encourage you to look that up. The ah. tool that Stephen's talking about is very handy. It's called an extractigator and uh, it allows you to pull um, fairly large buckthorn uh, bushes out of the ground with almost no effort, uh, just with the way that the tool creates some leverage for you to do that. 
Um, but buckthorn is challenging to manage because if you cut it and leave the stump, it just uh, it, it just starts shooting up little um, little shoots like crazy everywhere. So you can actually do uh, some sometimes worse damage by cutting down a buckthorn and then not treating it. So generally what we do with buckthorns is we cut them and then treat the stump with some kind of, an, of a herbicide. And I know that's not something that's widely necessarily available to people, um, but little buckthorns can be pulled out and especially the seedlings too, they're actually quite easy uh, to pull out of the ground. As for prickly ash, prickly ash is native. Uh, and I know I saw somebody's comment about it taking over their fields. And, and I know we have this problem in so many places. Uh, it's Absolutely. one of those early successional species that moves in <clears throat> really quickly um, on, you know, once something is taken away, like cows or some kind of disturbance fire is taken out of the, the landscape. Um, <clears throat> if you know, you're trying to keep an open habitat for something like grassland birds. Continued mowing uh, can work for it, but it has to be done, like I said, with any mowing, pretty much religiously. Like you, you can't let it uh, grow back or it will grow back more vigorously. But the good thing, prickly ash is, you know, it's every field biologist's nightmare plant. It's just, ugh, I mean, you get, I have been injured so many times by prickly ash, but it is the host plant for the giant swallowtail butterfly. So it does do good things. So every time I'm out there and surrounded by prickly ash in whatever habitat, I just try to think, you know, giant swallowtails, giant swallowtails, giant swallowtails. So there is something good uh, about prickly ash. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, there was a question of we have black fungus on some of our shrubs, uh, thick lumpy ball. It sounds like black knot to me, but uh, um, they're wondering what should they do? I don't actually really have many suggestions for that. It's hard to tell because there's so many different types of fungus. I mm -hmm. think my I, I think my recommendation would probably be to contact like a, a tree service or something, and they might be able to come out and actually assess what specific one it is, because uh, it, it really depends on on what you're you're looking at. Sure. Yep. And um, another question that might raise the blood pressure a knot or two as I was looking at a list of harmful species in Canada and cats were at the top of the list mm -hmm. feral and roaming outside cats environment Canada says cats kill 200 million birds a year in Canada um, are there any recommendations for um, controlling that a little bit? So, yeah, I mean, and I, this, this isn't raising my blood pressure and I am a cat lover and I have two cats, <laughs> but uh, I think that, so keeping them inside, cats should be kept inside. Um, and if your cats have to go outside, there are actually some really neat things um, you can buy, like types of collars that they have that actually will scare birds away in advance. So they, they can't get to them as quickly. They can't be as swift and, and quiet as they normally would be. Um, but yeah, keeping cats inside is, is so critical because they really do. They are, they are one of the worst uh, invasive species. Mm -hmm, right. And also if you might, everyone might notice in the chat, uh, Lawrence uh, says the extractigator is awesome for pulling buckthorn, but not cheap and 175 Canadian. Sometimes it's worthwhile for a few of us who have buckthorn to get together and buy one tool uh, and then share it among ourselves. The, you know, the idea of everybody having their own tool, we probably should dispose of that as well and, uh, and share a little bit more. Um, that is, uh, for most of the questions, I think you, you answered so many questions in your presentation. That was, uh, <laughs> that was uh, great. And uh, that's all I have. And I will turn it back over to Susan. Um, hi, Amanda, Dave Johnson here. Um, so hi there. I'd, I'd um, like... Yeah, I think that's it for the... Um... I think that's it for the questions. I think we've uh, actually got them all, all uh, answered. So I'm going to turn this over at this moment to Dave Johnson. 
Um, can you hear me? I, I started to speak a moment ago and I, uh, yeah. are you yeah. not hearing me? Hello? I hear you. Yes. Okay. Oh, hi, Amanda. So um, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much and, and very informative as a lot of people have, uh, have testified to that they learned a lot from this. And I think that's what we're looking for from these uh, winter speaker series is what people come out for is to, to learn a little bit more about our environment and our, our ecology. And I think tonight with invasive species, that, that's a kind of topic that really, uh, you know, resonates with a lot of folks, particularly property owners. And I think that's what you probably have here is a, a lot of property owners that, you know, want to learn more and uh, so they can do something for themselves and for our environment on their own property. So we're very lucky to have um, a resource, uh, such a knowledgeable, knowledgeable resource such as yourself to, uh, to uh, impart that knowledge to us. And so I'd like to, on behalf of uh, Friends of the Salmon River, I'd like to thank you very much for the uh, informative presentation and, and thanks for being part of our group uh, with Friends at Salmon River. We're lucky to have you, thank you. Absolutely, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> and I'm going to give the uh, uh, mic over to uh, Lawrence O'Keefe for a moment because he's going to mention our next um, uh, uh, our next speaker coming up in the series. Thanks, Susan. Because many of you know, I'm Lawrence O'Keefe with Friends of the Napanee River. Our second last event in our winter speaker series will be on Tuesday, May 18th. Olivia Hughes from Quinney Conservation will be speaking on how we as individual property owners can deal with stormwater, whether our property is in a town or city or in a large rural property. Olivia is a stormwater project coordinator at Quinty Conservation, a graduate of Queen's University, and she's very familiar with our region because she grew up on the Salmon River watershed, just a short walk from Beaver Lake. Olivia's presentation is just in time for our spring garden planting, and she will suggest some very innovative and attractive solutions on managing stormwater runoff on our properties, otherwise known as green infrastructure or low impact development. We hope, we hope you'll be able to join us. As in the past, announcements and registrations for this, for this Zoom event will be sent out in early May, or you can just keep an eye on our Friends of the Salmon River or Friends of the Napanee River websites. Back to you, Susan. Great, yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Lawrence. And um, that about wraps up our uh, event for this evening. Um, we will, of course, make sure that everyone gets the resources that were uh, mentioned in the uh, uh, in uh, Amanda's presentation, and uh, we will make sure that you, of course, all get the um, link uh, in the next couple of days. The link to this uh, recording will be sent out uh, so that you can share it with friends if you like. And um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. It was really nice tonight. We had a lot of people show up, so um, you know, tell your friends. So probably are lots of other people that would like to have these resources, and obviously. Um, doing all the work we can to, um, uh, to, to get invasive species um, out, of our, out of the mix so that we can encourage much more biodiversity is what we want to do. Oh, one last thing I did um, mean to mention was Friends of the Salmon River did actually do some work on Phragmites um, on Beaver Lake uh, when it was last actually possible, what was it, two falls ago? When it was actually possible to uh, go out as a group and did remove some um, quite a good stand of Phragmites there. And I know Amanda is still keeping her eye very closely on it. And when it's safe to, we will go over and do some more work there. But apparently um, we did make a dent. We did actually get rid of a fair bit and uh, we will do a few uh, plantings over there of, um, uh, of good plants uh, to try and um, restore the area a little bit. So thanks very much everybody. And uh, thanks for coming. And we hopefully will see you in May at the next event. Night. It's kind of fun watching the